Hey everyone, in this video we're going to look at the ideal gas law and the combined gas law, which is an extension of the ideal gas law that's really useful whenever we have some properties of the gas changing, such as the pressure increasing or the volume decreasing, that sort of a thing. We'll start with the ideal gas law, look at what each variable represents, do a problem with it, and then we'll derive the combined gas law from that ideal gas law and then use that to do a couple problems as well. The timestamps are here in case you want to jump to a specific part that you're looking for. Without further ado, let's uh, jump to the whiteboard and get started. All right, so here's the ideal gas law, or Pufnert, as I think about it to remember what the variables are. In this ideal gas law equation, PV equals NRT, P stands for pressure, and we're going to see that in most often atmospheres, but it could also show up in MMHG, it could be in TOR, it could be in some other units. Those are the most common three units in the AP exam, and it's important to pay attention to the units in this whole equation. We'll see why in just a minute. Next, we have the volume, and that's going to come up in liters, usually. The next variable is N, which is the amount of substance, or the number of particles, really, but we measure that in moles. Moles will tell us how many particles there are, or in other words, the amount of substance. Let's skip R for a second and go to T, which is for temperature. And the units of temperature are always going to be the same thing, which is going to be Kelvin. If they're ever in some other unit, such as Fahrenheit or pretty commonly Celsius, for this equation, we need to convert to Kelvin. And really, anytime we're multiplying or dividing with temperature, it's got to be in Kelvin, because Kelvin is the only absolute temperature scale that we have. Celsius is sort of shifted, like zero is not the lowest that it can go, whereas in Kelvin, zero Kelvin is the lowest that the temperature can go, which allows us to use Kelvin in terms of proportional things like multiplying and dividing in equations like this. So the temperature has to be in Kelvin. The only times where it doesn't have to be is if you're adding or subtracting. If you're adding or subtracting, Celsius works just fine, but we got to be in Kelvin here. All right, the last variable here is really not a variable, it's a constant, and that's the ideal gas constant, R. When you look this up, there's different values for it. The AP equations and constant sheet has three different ones. The big thing we have to look at here, though, is what are the units that all of our other variables are in? We gotta make sure those match the units of R. This is really important. We've gotta use the right R that matches the units, or we have to convert the units in all these other variables, like P, V, N, and T, in order to match the units of R. So what does this equation allow us to do? Well, if we know three of the variables, we can solve for the fourth one. Our first problem says, how much pressure is exerted by 1.85 moles of H2 gas placed in a three liter container at 35 degrees Celsius? So how do I know that I'm supposed to use the ideal gas law in this problem in the first place? Well, take a look at what information we know and what we're trying to find. We're trying to find the pressure. We know 1.85 moles, so that's gonna be in the amount of substance or the amount of the gas that we have. It's placed in a three liter container, that's our volume, and it's at 35 degrees Celsius, that's gonna be our temperature. If I just look at the information they gave us, they gave us N, V, and T, and we're trying to solve for P, that clues me in right away that the ideal gas law is where I'm gonna go for this. Also notice I have written right above my head here, under ideal gas law, it says nothing is changing. Notice I don't have some a beginning pressure and then some ending pressure where that pressure is changing, I gotta find how some other variable changes, we're gonna use something called the combined gas law for that a little bit later on. But the ideal gas law is for when nothing's changing, we just got a gas in a container here, we know a bunch of information about it, we're trying to find one unknown fact that we don't know. So let's set up the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. In this case, we're solving for pressure, so the way that I like to go about these is I isolate the variable that I'm trying to find. So I'm gonna isolate the P, I'm gonna do that by dividing by V on both sides and I'm gonna get P equals NRT over V, and then I'm gonna substitute in all the values. Now the main mistake I see students do when they're substituting the values in is not making it so that the units for all the other variables are the same as the units for R, and so you don't get units dividing out and you don't get the correct value at the end. So let's go through this. N is gonna be our number of moles, so we've got 1.85 moles. For R, we need to look at our ideal gas constants. We need an ideal gas constant that has liters in it, that has moles, and here we have degrees Celsius, but we're gonna convert that to Kelvin later on. So we need Kelvin, moles, and liters. There's actually two gas constants that we can use here. I personally um, wanna get my answer in atmospheres. I just use atmospheres a little bit more often in problems. So we're gonna use the ideal gas constant that matches that. In this case is 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. I've got liters, moles, Kelvin, and I'm gonna get my answer for pressure in atmospheres at the end. All right, next we have our temperature. And so, like I said, we have to use Kelvin here whenever we're multiplying. So we've got 35 degrees Celsius. I'm gonna convert that. 35 plus 273 is gonna give us 298 Kelvin. I'm gonna put that down in our equation. 
Finally, I'm gonna divide by our volume, which is three liters. I wanna make sure that my units all divide out here. So we've got moles and moles, we have liters and liters, we have Kelvin and Kelvin, and we're left with atmospheres. So our answer for pressure is gonna be in atmospheres. So I'll sub this into my calculator and I get 15.1 atmospheres. Rounded to three sig figs, so that's the fewest sig figs I have. All three of these have three. So that's how you use the ideal gas law to solve for an unknown quantity. Now let's take a look at something called the combined gas law, which is for when you have something changing. So maybe you've got a gas at a certain pressure, temperature, volume, but you're gonna change it. You're gonna heat it up maybe, so your pressure's increasing. Well, some other variable is going to change. This is what you can use to figure out how do those other variables change whenever you heat something or compress a gas into a smaller volume or something like that. For AP chemistry, this combined gas law isn't provided on the equation sheet. So I'm gonna show you how to quickly derive that from the ideal gas law. So let's start with the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, and we're gonna isolate R. So I'm gonna divide by N and T on both sides here, and that's gonna give me PV over NT equals R. Now R, remember, is just the ideal gas constant. So for any ideally behaving gas, the ratio of PV over NT is gonna be equal to the same thing no matter what. It's gonna be equal to R. If we change one of those variables, let's say by heating it so my temperature increases and that's gonna maybe cause the pressure to increase, maybe the volume is gonna change, or maybe not depending on the container. Whatever new values I get, they're still gonna be equal to R because that's gonna be a constant. So I'm gonna write ones by each of those variables to denote that this is sort of my PV and NT values before I've made some change, before I've heated or compressed or done something to the gas. Now, as I make a change to the gas, my P is gonna change, so I'm gonna have a new pressure. My V is gonna change, I'll have a new volume, maybe, or maybe the volume stays the same, I don't know, but it could change. We could have a different number of moles of gas. Now, for heating it or compressing it, not, but let's say I inject some more gas into the container, then my N could change and my temperature might change. But take a look here, the P and V over NT is still gonna be equal to R, remember, because the R is the constant. So use a little math logic here. If this fraction is equal to R, and this fraction, after the change, is still equal to R, well, those two fractions, the two PV over NTs, would be equal to each other. So you can change all these variables, but the ratio or the fraction here is still gonna be the same thing. This turns out to be extremely useful for us, which we'll see in the problem that we're about to do. So we've got the ideal gas law, we've got the combined gas law. And again, I've said this a bunch of times, but the combined gas law, we're gonna use that anytime something is changing. One of the properties is changing, therefore other properties are changing. This is gonna be really useful to us because it's got the initial pressure, volume, amount, and temperature, but it also has a final pressure, temperature, amount, and volume. In contrast to that, the ideal gas law, we're just gonna use that whenever there's not anything changing. So we're just trying to find one of the unknown values, but we know all of the other values. But to really understand the combined gas law, we need to look at a problem. Originally, a sample of carbon dioxide gas is in a rigid container at 289 Kelvin and 0.75 atmospheres. The rigid container means the container won't get bigger or smaller, so my volume won't be changing here. Any variable that doesn't change is gonna simplify our combined gas law. We'll see that in a second. The question says, what is the new pressure when the carbon dioxide in the container is heated to 425 Kelvin? So we're gonna start this by writing out our combined gas law. Now again, how do I know to use the combined gas law, not the ideal gas law? Well, we have an initial state. I see the word originally, that means kind of the beginning. I see a temperature here, but then I see a new temperature later on. As soon as I see, okay, the temperature's changing, that clues me in, combined gas law is what I wanna use here. So I write that out, P1V1 over N1T1 equals P2V2 over N2, that's kinda hard to say. P2V2 over N2T2, got it. So let me identify the variables that I know so far. My 289 Kelvin is my original temperature. The 0.75 atmospheres, that's my original pressure. Um, my new pressure that it's asking me to find, that's gonna be P2. And then 425 Kelvin, that's after I've heated it, that's gonna be T2. Notice I have P and T, but I, I don't have anything about N or V. So my next step is to think about, are there variables that aren't changing as I heat this gas? Well, it says it's in a rigid container, which means my volume is not gonna be changing. So this is gonna greatly simplify my equation here. I can just cross out the two Vs because my volume isn't gonna change. Let's say it was five liters here. It's still five liters there. I could divide by five on both sides and that V is gonna drop out of the equation. Next, if I'm heating a gas, is the number of actual gas particles gonna change? Well, no, they're gonna, they're gonna get hotter, the, the pressure's gonna change, but I'm gonna still have the same number of gas particles. The only way that would change is if there's a reaction taking place 
or if I was injecting more gas into my container in some way. But here it's not changing, so I'm gonna cross out N and T. So that simplifies this down to P1 over T1 equals P2 over V2. And now I have one variable that I don't know, which is P2, and I can solve for it. So I'll start by multiplying by T2 on both sides so that I can isolate P2. I get P2 equals P1 T2 over T1. So now let me sub in for those variables. My P1 is 0.75 atmospheres. My T2, be careful here that you're subbing the right T's, is 425 Kelvin. I'm gonna divide by T1, which was 289 Kelvin. Let's check my units. Kelvin is gonna cross out. I'm left with atmospheres, so my answer is gonna be in atmospheres. A note on units on this, temperature has to be in Kelvin because we're multiplying and dividing. All right, so that gives us a pressure of 1.1 atmospheres. And I can kind of double check my answer with some logic here. I increase the temperature, and if I increase the temperature, the gas particles are gonna be moving faster, they're gonna be colliding with the container a little bit faster, and that's gonna cause greater pressure as they collide with the container. So my pressure should have gone up. Did it go up? Yeah, it went from 0.75 atmospheres to 1.1 atmospheres. So I can be reasonably confident I didn't make a big mistake in my calculation. So that's how we use the combined gas law. I started by writing the whole gas law out, then I crossed out any variables that aren't changing to simplify my equation. Then I isolate the variable that I need to solve for. And then I just do some algebra from there. Let's look at one more problem. This is going to be a qualitative problem, so it's not asking me to calculate anything. In the case where you're not calculating something, you're doing a qualitative reasoning situation, you can kind of use either equation. This says when a sample of gas in a closed container of constant volume is heated until its absolute temperature is doubled, which property is also doubled? There's a lot going on here, so I like to use the equation as a way for me to organize the problem in my brain. So I start out with PV equals NRT. I tend to use the ideal gas law here, but I'll show you how to use it with either one. It says absolute temperature is doubled. Absolute temperature means working in Kelvin. We don't have any units here, so not too relevant to us, but absolute temperature is doubled. So I'm gonna write a times two on top of the T. I know that my temperature is doubled. I'm gonna look through all the other variables and see which one could also be doubled as the question is asking me here. Now R, could R ever be doubled? No, it's a constant, right? So that one I'm gonna cross out. It's not what I'm looking for here. The number of moles, let's just think about it kind of with some logic. If we were to heat it up and double the temperature, would the amount of gas change? No, same number of gas particles. That's not gonna be changing there. It says a container of constant volume. Well, the V isn't gonna change then. If the container's rigid, it's not stretchy like a balloon or something. So it's gotta be P by process of elimination here, but let's think about why that would be. For this equation to be true, Whatever I do to one side, I gotta do to the other side. So if I'm doubling the T, for this still to be a true equation, something on this side has to also double. So my pressure is gonna double. Another way to think about this is to use the combined gas law. So I'm gonna write out the combined gas law here. I'm gonna go through and just cross out any variables I know aren't changing. So I know my volume's not changing. We talked about why already. I know my N isn't changing. We're not getting more gas here. And it says the temperature is doubled. So I'm gonna show that here. I'm doubling my temperature. So I multiply the denominator by two. What do I have to do to the numerator for this still to be true? Well, I'd have to multiply pressure by two as well. And so I know that my temperature doubles, therefore my pressure has to double in this case. Now the question might not be asking specifically about temperature and pressure, it could be asking about volume, amount of gas, or some other combination of these, but you can still use the same framework to figure it out. But a takeaway here is whenever you have a qualitative problem, you can really use either gas law for your reasoning. All right, so that was an intro into the ideal gas law and the combined gas law. I hope that was helpful. Also, if you notice, I'm repping some cool stuff that I like. This is the new logo for the wheelchair basketball team that I play on, the Memphis Grizzlies wheelchair basketball team. I've got a Mizzou hat on here. That's where I went to college. And then I've got a, a tattoo of the Memphis skyline because Memphis is a cool place to live. And if you found this helpful, do the subscribe. I hate asking for that, but...